Well, I'll try to, first of all, share my screen again. And of course, I have to thank you guys for inviting me in this uh, uh, venue to present part of my work that was uh, conducted in the last few years. Um, I joined UC Davis 2013 and 13, 14, 15 were drought. And there was a double drought because it was a drought, physical drought, you know, the start of upcoming environmental regulations. And then there was a drought of people because all the other irrigation specialists retired. And so they left me California, you know, the full, <laughs> the full state to, I would say, uh, to learn from. And so uh, it was a kind of a, you know, steep learning curve, but I'm pretty, uh, happy of the work that um, was uh, done in the in the last few years. So I thought about uh, presenting some um, a couple of projects of applied research that um, I was leading or or uh, I was uh, part of the team um, to show you know ways that uh, we could probably enhance the agricultural water management. And those were mainly focusing, focusing on specialty crops. And specialty crops are pretty important in California in terms of income. Uh, so um, let me put in a presentation mode because I always forget. So um, I, I plan to give, you know, a few background information on California agriculture and water. Um, touch a little bit upon the, the trends, the long-term trends and water-related implication, and then, and then start uh, describing what we did to improve agricultural water management for special, specialty crops, especially, uh, you know, focusing on, on one project that took about probably five to six years uh, to start and finish. Uh, and that was the uh, project on uh, um, updating the information on water use of uh, micro-irrigated pistachio. Um, and the second project I would like to talk about is uh, uh, the evaluation of forecast uh, reference evapotranspiration, a product by the National Weather Service that is called FRET. And that, uh, uh, that piece of work will allow some prospective uh, irrigation scheduling. And I'll, I'll touch upon the, the, the concept of perspective. Um, and then uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll describe some upcoming work and the work that we just started uh, as a follow-up of these two projects. Um, just a few numbers and figures to describe California agriculture in terms of uh, uh, economics. Um, as you can see here, um, uh, this is uh, this table describes uh, somehow the uh, cash income generated in uh, uh, in 2019, and it was taken from the USDA CDFA Ag report. It's an annual report. As you can see, the the, the total income generated by uh, California agriculture in 2019 was 52.6 billion, and here you have the uh, somehow the cash income uh, broken down by commodity group and fruit and nut crops are the first commodity in economic terms, generating almost 41% of the total cash income. And then livestock, poultry and products, vegetable crops, field crops, and all the other source of income. But this is just to say that fruit and nut crops in, in California, and especially in the San Joaquin Valley, really are a top uh, tier um, economic uh, uh, cash income crop. Um, here is a, a map of the main agricultural production area uh, throughout the state of California. Uh, the area in yellow, highlighted in yellow, is the San Joaquin Valley. And this is, a, uh, this is really a, a kind of a powerhouse of, uh, of agricultural production because seven of, out of the 10 agricultural counties in California are located in the San Joaquin Valley, in this yellow area. And it's also called the fruit basket of the world. Um, and alone, the San Joaquin Valley, this central part of the state of California, generate almost 60% of the total California agricultural income. 
Um, now, the state of California is also, has some other records that are not necessarily good records, is the top, um, is the number one state in the nation for agricultural water usage. And this is related to the intensity of agriculture and also to the acreage and availability of farmland that produce a variety of uh, different crops. We are almost uh, um, slightly over 400, 400 different crops throughout the state. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the top irrigated land use by acreage is again, uh, fruit and nut orchards and vineyards. Now, when we talk about long-term trends, um, this in the last 30, probably 30, 40 years, irrigated agriculture has been concentrating and intensifying, concentrating, you know, in three specific areas, the San Joaquin Valley, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, and the Imperial. Now, these areas, uh, production areas, allow somehow intensification because they have kind of a water secure, more secure water than um, many other production area in, in the state. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley has the, the you know, the, the groundwater, uh, the, the, the Bay um, Delta area as uh, some of the surface water and the, the low desert and the Imperial Valley as a somehow more secure water than any other um, uh, production areas in California, thanks to the Colorado, Colorado River Basin. Now, uh, these three um, production areas uh, generate almost 35% of the US table food uh, on 1.2% of the US farmland. And this gives you somehow the magnitude of the production and the intensity of the production of these three areas combined. In, 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 as I mentioned, in this three production area, the cropping pattern are really intensified, being intensifying with a clear conversion from uh, annual to perennial crop, mainly fruit, nuts, and, 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 and vineyards. Um, we saw you know, much higher planting density and, and this new orchards and vineyards require a lot more inputs. And that means water and nutrients. And there's a clear shift from surface irrigation method to micro irrigation method because the amount of water that could be used beneficially by the crop with this more precise and more localized irrigation method allows a better water productivity. So more uh, crop per drop. Um, when it comes to, let me move this, I always get confused with the, <laughs> with the, the zoom. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, the other factor, uh, the intensification has been somehow fostered or promoted through incentives from federal and state funding program toward a more productive, more intensive, um, uh, irrigated agriculture. Um, the other trend is that water agency and, regulating, and regulators are promoting a shift from uh, um, uh, different irrigation method, mainly surface irrigation method and sprinkler to micro irrigation. And this somehow is misconception and micro irrigation uses less water but uh, the purpose uh, of shifting to micro irrigation was mainly for water conservation purposes. And this happened through federal and state financing, financial incentives. So growers reacted to this financial incentives following the push and moving to micro irrigated uh, um, crops, but also they changed they shifted from annual field crops to permanent crops, and also they expanded the acreage in, you know, planted in order to maximize net profit. But this resulted uh, for sure not in a net water saving. Um, these are um, results from uh, a periodic survey of irrigation method that is normally conducted every, used to be conducted every 10 years, but now is conducted every five years 
uh, jointly by the Department of Water Resources and UC Davis, and this is a result of the last irrigation method survey. You can see here in this graph on the left, a clear, you know, sharp decline of a gravity, gravity uh, irrigation method in the black that moved during the last 40 years, 50 years from 80% to 30%. And the difference being picked up by um, drip, basically drip and micro. Uh, sprinkler methods stay pretty much constant and it tended to decline, especially in the last few uh, years due to energy related uh, aspects and also water related aspects. And then subsurface uh, irrigation uh, somehow picked up a little bit from three to 7% in the last 10 years. Uh, on the other side, as I was describing, there's a, a clear shift from field crops over the years um, towards more uh, orchards and vineyards, as I was mentioning, for maximizing the net profit. Uh, vegetables stay pretty much the same and all the other crop increased a little bit, but it clear the, the sharp decline is for field crop and then and the sharp increase is for orchards and vineyards. Um, all this new situation with drip irrigated orchard and, orchards and vineyards require more precise and also skilled irrigation scheduling and management. So here the, 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 um, the value at stake are much higher. And so with water, uh, basically farmer can be very uh, profitable in their activity, but also the risk is pretty high. And so if they don't have enough water or they mismanage the water, you know, there's clear consequences in, in terms of yield and quality of the production. Now, in this context, the rationale for uh, optimal, I would say optimal irrigation management has been in California traditionally to irrigate, uh, trying to meet the crop consumptive use. And so this is uh, basically what we call crop evapotranspiration. So with irrigation, we try to match the amount of water that the crop will use under no water limitation, trying to avoid water stress. And so this is basically what we, what we consider when we have to schedule irrigation or schedule the delivery by water district to different areas or different uh, uh, production areas within a common, within a service area. So under well water conditions, so that means no water stress, we, normally in California estimate uh, the crop consumptive use, uh, uh, crop evapotranspiration as a product of reference evapotranspiration, which is referred to grass. Um, so the amount of water used by grass under no water limitation, under no agronomic constraint, multiplied by an adjustment coefficient, which is called crop coefficient. And then re reversing this equation, you know, solving for the crop coefficient, you can get a crop coefficient by dividing the crop evapotranspiration by the reference evapotranspiration. Now, this is a common terminology for irrigation people and for water people for normally for the water balance that we normally run. But um, now there are two components here. One is, trying to get a good estimate or a good measurement of the reference of evapotranspiration, and then trying to have good value and reliable and accurate value of the crop coefficient. Uh, for what concern reference of evapotranspiration in California, we normally rely on the CIMIS weather network, is a, a network of automated weather station that pretty much 152, um, uh, weather station distributed throughout the state, not regularly distributed, but mostly in the uh, concentrated in the agricultural production area. Their point station as the one that you see in the picture in the corner here, but also CIMIS has generated additional product with a spatial CIMIS, and this is an interpolated um, uh, um, basically surface of uh, um, reference CT that is available from the Department of Water Resources. So if your um, farm is located not in the vicinity of uh, uh, an automa automated weather station, you can still get 
pretty much reliable information by clicking on those maps that are interactive and can give you value uh, of reference of apple transpiration there's also a new product uh, relatively new that was generated uh, developed by the national weather service together with dwr and uc davis is called fret as you can see fret stands for forecast et and so you can have forecast of a reference of apple transpiration up to seven days ahead and there's having the possibility to anticipate what will be the atmospheric water demand helps a lot in scheduling irrigation and in scheduling water delivery for water district but also anticipating uh, the water demand for seven days ahead now, the question now becomes how accurate are the crop coefficient in California? Because they mostly were developed during the last 30, 40 years. And the question is, are they still valid under the extremely dry and intensifying condition that we have now for the different production area? It's still a pending question mark. Now, in terms of uh, available information on crop water use, as I was mentioning, the studies on ET and crop coefficient for the different uh, uh, permanent crops and field crops in California were mostly done during the 70s or the 80s with methods that are pretty laborious, like lysimeter studies or try to infer indirectly the amount of water used by the crop by tracking, keeping track of or monitoring the soil water through neutron probe reading, or sometimes the crop coefficient were developed just by educated guests, by experts. Anyway, those studies were normally conducted during the past 30 to 40 years for cropping system and irrigation method. There are very were very different with respect to what we have now, because now we have new rootstock, new crop varieties, uh, higher planting density. Uh, there are different canopy management practices, especially for for orchards and vineyards. We have drip irrigation, which is spoon feed water and nutrient to the crop. And so basically this is a different water regime for the plants. And also crops are now growing in areas that have marginal soil or have non-uniform soil. So there's a lot of spatial variability. But the main factor here is that the crop now have a much higher yield than you know the crop uh, of 30, 40 years ago for a variety of reasons. And so those crops will probably have a different water requirement with respect to what was defined during the study during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. There are also some other factors. Some crops were less important in the past, and now they largely expanded the, in, 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 in acreage, or they are grown under different conditions, and they're not uniform. Uh, one of these is citrus that now we have different mandarin and, and hybrid uh, varieties that are being planted with, you know, higher planting density. The canopy size is very different from the past and there's a variety of uh, pruning practices and also they're planting with different row orientation. Pistachio is another example, it is now grown on different rootstock with respect to the past and is mostly, you know, there's a there's a expanding acreage on salt affected soils and before those marginal soils were not even used or used uh, by other crops. Wine grapes is another example. Now we have a lot of wine grapes planted on sloping ground on hills, hillside and they're planted with different, um, you know, aspects with respect to the north, south, or east, west, and, you know, south facing, north facing. And so there's a lot more to know about the crop water use. Table grapes and raisins, another example that we got different trellis with that, with that. we got T-shaped or Y-shaped or uh, the gobble, higher, low trellis or California sprawl. So there's so much now and, that, and it's so different with respect to the past that, you know, make us question about the crop coefficient that were developed for 
different cropping system in the past. Now, there's a clear need for updating the crop coefficient and the information on crop water use, but at an on-farm level for a variety of uh, reasons, mostly for scheduling irrigation or for anticipating what will be the, the amount of water that is uh, needed also I'm back. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sometime, you know, it's a uh, connection not very steady. Can you see now? Um, can you see back my screen? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. All right. There's also, at the farm level, there's also the need to know uh, if we can maintain or can even expand the planted acreage in the specific areas or we need to shrink, we need to retire some uh, planted areas. And, and as that, you know, there's uh, also a prospect for increasing uh, drought occurrence and more severe drought occurrence. So uh, I think on, on a farm level, it's also, you know, knowing that crop water use is also important to design and implement deficit irrigation strategy. At the off-farm level, there's a variety of reasons why, you know, better knowledge of crop water requirements or crop water use, it's important. And compliance for with existing regulation or for moving water be, in, in um, you know, between hydrologic reason with water transfer or water market. But also there's other purposes like uh, to design uh, a financial incentives and also um, um, uh, also for estimating the economic water productivity of crops. So those are a set of reasons why we should probably know better how much water is used by the different crop under the, 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 the current uh, cropping condition. Now, the, you know, on the weather side, as I mentioned on the reference ET um, side, I wanted to describe a little bit of, of, of this forecast ET because it's a pretty um, interesting as a product to anticipate the atmospheric water demand seven days ahead. Uh, this was uh, this is a new product was a new product uh, developed by the National Weather Service together with UC Davis and, and DWR, and this was uh, developed for improving you know, high frequency irrigation man management. So uh, basically micro irrigation management and also encourage and foster the adoption of ET based uh, irrigation schedule in California. Um, FRET um, forecast, yeah, reference ET forecast are now available up to seven days ahead. So you can have one one, two, three, five, and seven days ahead forecast. And it's available for the entire continental US. And this is uh, the way um, the way the FRET table used to uh, look like. Now the National Weather Service transfer everything, everything into maps. And, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to download values for the next seven days ahead, but I'll show you how it looks like now we are pushing to get back on the table because growers were used this this type of table pretty much uh, up to probably six months ago. And when this table 
disappear, it's kind of a damage for them because uh, the maps are not so straightforward. And then they need, here is a, how it looks like for the entire continental United States. Um, and you can see the different, in, different, different intensities of color for with a scale on top of it. And this is a, a little bit more um, a detailed map or Visalia, Porterville, uh, so the, the southern Southern Joaquin Valley. And you can see now you can call also some uh, table out of this map, but it's a it's a less straightforward than than, um, than it was in the past. Now, reference ET, when we get it from SIMIS, are considered somehow, are described as near real time information on reference ET. But um, uh, in, in, in reality, they are retros retrospective. Uh, and so they are referred to the period that has just passed. And so when it comes to schedule on farm irrigation, this is a little bit um, uh, limiting and I'll show you why. So when you look at the past, uh, the past days uh, and you want to use ET data from the, 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 the few days that are just past either one or three days or one week or two weeks that are past, when we use these values to schedule water delivery to growers or irrigation, then there, are some, there is some problems. And I'll show you for many locations, in fact, in California, there are periods there, you know, the weather conditions are pretty much uh, um, uh, changing on a daily basis or every two days, two, three days, or from week to week. And, and this is an example from Napa Valley, for, for instance, in the northern coast that you can see April, May, and June. This is a three-day cumulative reference ET. This is what normally is used for scheduling irrigation in grapes in the Napa Valley. And you can see here, look, three days, uh, from three days to the next three days, how much the weather is changing in different parts of the crop season. And when it, this happens, um, when this happens in periods that are pretty sensitive, either water excess or water shortage, then using the data from the past days to schedule irrigation for the next week, then you run the risk of carrying forward errors and mistakes. Uh, see here uh, another example again for Napa Valley for September, the end of the uh, growing season for grapes, which is pretty important for the determination of the yield for the subsequent season. And even here, you got the weather that's pretty much changing from, you know, from one period to the next. Every two or three days, it changed quite a bit. And you can see how much is the fluctuation. Now, this area is exposed to the ocean um, income uh, through the, uh, the Bay Delta, but this is not the only example in California where there's a lot of variation from day to day or every two, three days. Uh, when we come to the seven days cumulative reference ET, again, see how much is the difference from one week to the next. So if we use last week ET to schedule next week irrigation, there's a big risk of going under or above. And so we run the risk of over irrigating or under irrigating. And this is pretty uh, dangerous for certain crops when it's important to schedule water, um, the application of water precisely for water for uh, fruit quality or for yield determination for the next uh, next season. Now, forecast ET, FRET, forecast basically all the weather variables. Uh, here is a, uh, an, an equation for calculating the reference ET is the most widely used equation is the FAO Pema Monti. And so you see a bunch of parameter here. Now, FRET forecast, uh, almost all the weather variable that are inputted in this equation and that are needed for calculation uh, of reference ET. Uh, the only exception is the uh, solar radiation, which is calculated from the forecast uh, daily fraction cloud cover. So it's basically calculated based on the uh, ratio between the actual and the potential sunshine hours. But other than, than, than the radiation, all the uh, other parameters are forecast by this global forecast system or GFS model. 
Now, we conducted in 2020 a validation work to see whether FRET is somehow reliable or match the, the uh, ET estimate that we got from observed value at the SIMIS station. So we selected 15 SIMIS locations in California. They are showing this map on the right. And uh, here are the, are the location with the number of the, the station and the reference ET zone and the type of climate that are typical in this area. So, so those uh, uh, stations were selected randomly throughout California in order to cover different climatic zone and different type of climate. In what we did, we compared what we got from the threat forecast for the different weather values weather variables um, against what we got from SIMIS in order to uh, assess whether the threat weather variable were estimated accurately. And then as a second step, we compared uh, the forecast reference ET for one, three, five, and seven days against the ET calculated from SIMIS weather uh, data. Um, it, what we did is somehow uh, try to understand whether the forecast ET were dependable and accurate, assuming that the SIMIS uh, reference ET is accurate. Now, here's the results that we got from June. We did for three uh, central months of the um, uh, growing season, June, July, and August. And here you can see the one-to-one -one line and the R square and also the regression equation between FRET on the uh, X axis and CMS uh, reference ET. So in June, the values are pretty much matching. Um, besides, you know, uh, some of the stations that are somehow off, and I'll explain to you, to you why. And we did this uh, validation for lower uh, reference ET, medium reference ET, and high reference ET, like Five Points or, da or Davis or Shafter. All these stations are somehow either in the Sacramento Valley or the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, we did this for the, uh, you know, one, three, five, and seven days. I'm just showing a uh, graph that are selected just for the sake of time, but also for seven days ahead, the situation is somehow pretty good in terms of the values that are, are matching. So the forecasted value are matching the measured value. And we did the same for July, and we did the same for August. And you can see there, you know, the data that are forecast by the National Weather Service can be used somehow reliably by farmers in order to simplify the irrigation schedule. But it can also be used by irrigation district and water district to anticipate the water delivery or the water needs that have to be uh, met in the different area of the uh, common uh, service area of the district. Now, this is everything together, you know, um, and um, somehow we develop some statistics in order to understand the root, root mean square error and the coefficient of determination for one, three, five, and seven days for the different station. And you can see there that the values of um, the RMSE and R square are pretty uh, reliable. And so this means the growers in this production area somehow can use this type of uh, information in order to anticipate the water demand. On FRET, uh, some conclusive remark. So the comparison between FRET forecast ET and CMS ET, and CMS ET was calculated from observed weather variable show some good agreement for all the 15 selected station location. And those station location, again, span from moderate, so from low to moderate ET to high ET demand. Um, the results also show that the seven days uh, reference ET forecasted are somehow nearly as good as a one day. And this is some somehow counterintuitive. When the forecast is a short term, we expect to be more accurate. But in this case, the seven days were 
nearly as accurate as a one day forecast. And that is pretty comforting. Uh, considering all the data together, R square range between 0 0.9 and 1, and, um, and the RMSE was mostly less than one millimeter per day that correspond to 0 0.04 inches per day. So the, the error or inaccuracy with respect to CIMIS was pretty negligible. Uh, poorest results in this uh, validation work with, were obtained for in station. They're somehow in, uh, uh, in um, peculiar um, climatic areas like Meloland in Imperial Valley. This is, a, this is a low desert. There's a lot of advection. And so somehow the results were not very uh, steady and not very uh, dependable. Torrey Pines is in the San Diego area, so there, as there's a lot of the ocean air inflow in that area that makes the prediction probably of the net radiation or the solar radiation a little bit more unreliable. Also, it's very difficult to predict wind uh, coming from the ocean. And the other was Camino in the El Dorado County, and this is surrounded by forest. And so also here, the, the, the forecast of the radiation was probably poor. And there was some slight overestimate in some areas of forecast ET versus CMS ET in some other mountain range or in, uh, in, um, in Napa Valley. In Napa Valley, there was some misfunction of the CMS station. And so uh, that, that station in 2019 was uh, uh, discontinued in, in, in operation for a month or so. And that somehow uh, made the, the, the comparison uh, uh, pretty uh, difficult. But anyway, FRET, after this validation work, we concluded that FRET reference ET, so the forecast reference ET is pretty reliable. It can help growers to somehow schedule irrigation for micro-irrigated crop, pretty reliable with respect to CIMIS as an alternative to CIMIS. Now, the cost of CIMIS is pretty high in California. And so if if a, a validation work for the entire number of the stations of CIMIS is done pretty accurately, then it means that it doesn't have to be maintained, although the CIMIS uh, uh, network is uh, you know, also the fruit of a large investment and, and uh, almost 30 years of operation has been used by a variety of users, not only irrigators or farmers or ranchers, but also IPM. And so there's multiple uses. And so anyway, uh, FRET is pretty reliable in the station where it was tested and can be used as a forecast. Um, now, um, this, uh, this piece of work was, uh, um, the results of this work uh, was uh, published in a, in a recent publication. Um, and you can get all the information about the, you know, the type of uh, data analysis, the type of processing that we did uh, by checking on this article. Uh, a few link um, here, where to get information about CIMIS, where to get information about spatial CIMIS, and where to get uh, the ET data from the National Weather Service in terms of weather forecast. Now, with that, I probably should not go too much into the detail of the crop water use, uh, because uh, for the sake of time, it's already um, 45 after. So I just want to mention that in the last six year, uh, I was part of a team that conducted a variety of field research studies to improve irrigation management of permanent crops. The first crop was pistachio. So we did a, a I would say a five to six year project with a lot of measurement in the field to update information on ET and crop coefficient of, of pistachio grown on non-saline and salt affected soils in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, the second project that was part of was uh, the, you know, trying to understand the effect of topography and uh, the uh, training system of the vines on the 
vineyard water use because uh, evapotranspiration is an energy related process. And so depending on your slope and aspect, you can intercept more or less radiation or you can intercept other source of energy like uh, wind or masses of uh, hot or cold air. So the, the topography and the aspect of the vineyard is pretty important and can uh, generate significantly different values of uh, crop water use. And we did this project both in California and in the Central Valley of Chile, and the results have been published and are being published for the Chilean um, um, situation uh, in, in an upcoming article. The third project that I was part of the team uh, uh, is uh, related to citrus and um, and so we measure the amount of water somehow used by mandarin and uh, navel orange in the San Joaquin Valley, in the eastern side of the San Joaquin Valley as a function of canopy size and row orientation. And that was uh, the third project that um, I uh, probably um, uh, would like to describe maybe in another in another uh, talk, but there's a variety of ongoing uh, research being done, and this uh, culminated in in a in a crop coefficient uh, uh, committee that we established in uh, 2018 with the DWR in order to analyze all the data that were field data that were collected during the last uh, 15 years by the different scientists and researcher and in order to make it available uh, for California growers and water district GSA. And this was uh, uh, a water smart project that we are about to start in March and will allow to somehow update the, uh, uh, the information on, on uh, um, actual water use and uh, consumptive water use of the top 10 uh, most water demanding crop in California. With that, I'll probably stop here and I will be happy to entertain questions if you guys have. Thanks, Daniele, that was awesome. You covered so many things. Um, yeah, um, so let's, I think we have some questions in the chat. So let's go one by one. Um, Okay, so there's a question on the, the forecast reference ET. Um, the question is with weather changing, uh, climate change influence. So kind of um, a comment on the stationarity, you know, concept. Um, and the question is, you know, how reliable the threat data is? Well, I think the, uh, the, the, the modeling capability of threat is somehow not based on uh, the past trends. And so the stationarity hypothesis is not considered, is not, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the, the uh, forecasting model is not built on the previous data, but it's built in the, on the possibility to anticipate uh, the weather variable on the basis of uh, other algorithms, but not based on past data. And so I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna be affected by the uh, extreme weather variability. And as we, as we showed in 2019 was a good water year, but at the same time, Fred was, a, was able to anticipate the, uh, or to forecast, um, uh, the, the, the clear, you know, weather variation from even in the short term. So I don't think the, the, the model, but you have to ask a climatologist, uh, probably is better uh, expertise to uh, ask this question, but I don't think the model is based on, on, on past trends and past data to anticipate, uh, because those are short time um, forecast up to seven days. Now I know that the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation uh, has been working in the past three years on another model. Uh, they're able is able to um, forecast on a monthly basis, and that probably is a model that is built on 
some of past data or historical data at the different sim station. Yes, but uh, this is a good question. But I mean, is, I, it, is, is it fair to say that our ability to forecast is kind of getting hard and hard because of the changing weather patterns due to climate change, right? Yeah, but the computational ability is also becoming refined and refined and refined. And so there's a multiple algorithms and, you know, and calculation procedure that you can input in the new modeling. And so I think it's true that the situation is becoming a little bit more and more and more difficult to anticipate or to forecast, but also the computational ability is becoming better and better. And so, especially with the climatic data and weather data, yeah. Good point, good point. Yeah, so next question is, what's your take on open ET? Could it be more reliable source for ET because it, because it is integrating the impact of new crop varieties on ET through satellite data? Okay, my take on, uh, on open ET is to wait and see and let the scientists work in order to refine the estimate. The first uh, shots were not really encouraging. We noticed we measuring ET on several crops with the, you know, edit covariance and and, and um, uh, surface renewal technique. And when we compare ET estimate by open ET, uh, basically the difference were pretty large in terms of 40, 50 percent plus and minus. But I, I would say this was the first shot and I will leave the scientists work and refine what they have. Um, in I think a little bit more ground truthing is needed for this model because this is a blend of for an ensemble of four to five models and, I, and probably they need to you know, calibrate and validate some of the, model, the modeling effort a little bit better into uh, uh, the different condition where the crops are grown. And so I expect the OpenET to provide reliable information, but it, it might take time. It might take some time. Yeah, um, and this next one is rather a comment on, I think you, you said something about CIMIS data reliability. Uh, so there's a comment here that says, um, I know that Camino station has no irrigation for the grass, tried to get it fixed, but now they are looking to move it. Hard to find someone to water the grass. So measurements also have problems. That's for sure. In fact, you know, our analysis uh, somehow sue. So we identify, let's, let's put it this way. We identify 15 station, uh, where the um, somehow the weather data were pretty reliable. We consulted with DWR. We knew Camino as a difficult station because of the uh, little bit of lack of maintenance in that area, but also the forest area. I think the question is from Lynn Wunderlich, right? And so, and I agree with her, the measurements could be very much improved, but we have to start from some, so, some basis. And the basis is the assumption that the SIM stations somehow provide reliable information. Now, uh, when you enter this question, it becomes a little bit more sophisticated because there might be a lot of sources of errors or uncertainties, especially, you know, uh, a sensor maintenance, sensor um, inclination, and, you know, it's, there's so much going on. And I would say probably um, even, even the same as uh, data could be improved with a uh, a little bit more effort in, in, in uh, you know, um, close uh, uh, control quality check. And, but I know DWR is doing a lot of effort to improve and automate some of the quality check for the weather variables, yes. Yeah, and the, uh, this next question is uh, related to your figure where you were showing the, the, the forecast ET compared to the observed for June and July. And the question is, how about forecasted ET in April and May? In the valley spring, weather will be more variable than June and July. Yeah, we, I think we did uh, June, July and August because they're central part of the irrigation season. And somehow in a wet year like 2019, if I remember well, it was a wet year, 
the spring rain covers somehow the uh, the irrigation requirements somehow is met by spring rain. And so we wanted to focus on in the most critical months also for yield and quality. So the most critical months were June, July, and August for the different specialty crowd. This is more, uh, you know, for, uh, um, you know, promoting the adoption of ET-based um, information for irrigation specialty crop and the sensitive stages uh, most of the crops are June, July and August. So, but yes, this is a good good point. We we could have run, you know, for multiple of the validation for multiple years, you know, like trying to cover a wet and a dry and average year and see May, June, July, August and September. But um, yeah, uh, this is a this is the first step. Maybe some you know additional validation work will be uh, uh, happening in, in the near future, yeah. Yeah, more work is needed, right? <laughs> so, yeah, the next, yeah, the next question is tied to the issue of having plenty, right? So now you have open ET data, you have, you know, uh, forecast ET, and you have probably, you know, uh, CIMIS ET, and then there's like, you know, a bunch of others. And the question, how does this, how does your data, ET data compares to open ET? And then which numbers should we rely on when you have too many options? Uh, I think um, my, my take is the, you know, to conduct a little bit more ground truthing, more validation work and try to use, so growers will use what they think is reliable, what, you know, they think it's been documented to be reliable and they've seen some problem with remote sensing um, and somehow they're waiting. They're waiting to see whether it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve uh, in terms of accuracy with respect to, uh, so they, they basically are in the field, you know, day by day and they know how much water they apply, especially the educated, uh, very, very well educated growers and they see some big differences. We run some uh, tests uh, and some, we did another study using one of the most widely used remote sensing model on pistachio and the results on pistachio, pistachio is a different beast with respect to most of the tree and, you know, the tree crops like almonds or, or, or table grapes or, you know, other tree crops. And we saw that the difference were pretty uh, substantial in terms of satellite uh, data with respect to the ground ground based data. I'm not saying that the ground based data are 100% accurate, but uh, we kept a very close eye on the maintenance and troubleshooting of the sensor on the ground and somehow we're pretty confident that what we get is, is I would say, more reasonable that was what was predicted in specific uh, timing uh, by uh, this uh, remote sensing based model. So there are crops where things might work better and other crops that are pretty physiologically uh, sophisticated and their response to the different uh, drivers of water use might be uh, not straightforward. And so remote sensing is probably very good to spot you know, problems in the field or to spot, you know, the spatial variability. Um, but I don't think we are at the point where remote sensing can be used operationally for scheduling irrigation. Not yet. Maybe there's, a, you know, a, few, a matter of years. Uh, but um, I would say ground truthing validation is the key to make all this uh, a source of information uh, reliably uh, usable. Yeah, okay, so we only have one minute and I have two questions. So um, let's quickly wrap this up. So what, one question, is there a need to update the KC database with more recent studies from the literature, you know, past 10, 15 years, not just doing new studies, but updating the, the future in an otherwise empty storage space? Yes, there's definitely the need to update KC values um, and this is what we are doing and this is what you know other scientists have been doing the last 30 years but what happens is when you when you come up with a new uh, KC set of values then 
growers change the variety, change the roots, how can they plant in density? So you, it's a never ending story. You have to start over because, uh, you know, light interception, energy interception is the main driver. And so if these parameters, physical and physiological parameters change, then you have to somehow keep working <laughs> and refine. Yeah, and the last question is, um, I think this is really an important one. It says, um, and this is something that I certainly, you know, share the same sentiment. Um, the question, I think we still have a problem as an extension edge in teaching growers how to use ET. The feedback I get is too many calculations. Is there any work going on to simplify that? Well, Fred doesn't have any calculation. You just have a reference ET, and then, you know, you rely on a set of uh, KC value. There are automation and, uh, you know, calculation engines that growers have already in the field. And so most of the educated growers are doing this work and, you know, they're making also product available to other growers for automating part of the process. And so it's true that some time is uh, based on calculation, but it's also true that technology is very helpful in the field to, um, you know, to provide synthetic information. You know, the, the commercial ET uh, station like Thule provide directly ET in inches of water or in uh, hours of operation of your irrigation system. And this is very helpful for growers to implement a little bit um, with more ease what they uh, used to um, calculate before. Well, with, with that, I would you know, um, take a moment to say thank you, Danielle, for this wonderful um, talk. And, and we all certainly learned um, you know, um, a thing or two today. And so um, we do uh, like to announce our next uh, speaker would be Luke Milleron, and he will be talking about orchard system and water management, soil management, and crop management on March 18th, um, again, starting at 3 p.m. Pacific. So do join us. Um, thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you, Danielle.